Well, welcome everybody. I am excited about a message uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you. And I want to really lay a foundation with you today for the next three weeks. Uh, I'll tell you, if you don't know much about me, I have a deep passion that God has placed on my heart to see the nations reach. So you're going to see we're still in our DNA series, um, but we're calling it DNA of Family Church from local to global. And the mission statement we want to continue to carry out is that we want to be people helping people find and follow Jesus. And that also extends to the places uh, throughout the globe for, for partnerships we have for reaching unreached peoples all around the world. So uh, that's my, my excitement about this is because we are not leaving behind the need of being local uh, people on mission, but we are going to look a little bit to the global perspective. So I want to remind you of the upper and lower room. We spent a little time talking about this over the last four weeks, but this is the model idea that when we gather, often we have our energies focused on the lower room. It's the place we attend, the building, or the personality, the person speaking, or the, the personality of the people around you, as well as the people who attend. And then finally, of course, there's the programs. And, and all of those are good. And we've just been talking about that those are elements that often draw people into relational communities. But it's the upper room, the mission of God that we are all called to because everything in the lower room is temporary. It, it's, it goes and comes and people come and go and buildings can, can be burned down. And, and yet we are called to the upper room. And so I want to make the case, though, that the upper room is dependent on the lower room. Uh, pictorially, obviously, without the lower room, the upper room falls. And so there's a, there's a connectiveness in that. And the same is true with the local call that we have in our lives to make disciples and the global call that we're going to press into today. And so I, I want this goal of mine is to make this tangible for you. Because I, I believe that we've done, uh, historically, the church has done not such a great job uh, throughout America of making it where you can see how tangible it is for you to actually engage the nations if you're not called to be the actual goer who goes into some of the foreign places of the world. And so I want to make this the goal for me and for you, is that you would see there's a clear connection between what we can do here and what we can do out there. That there's a clear tangibility of how you can be involved and that God is calling you to be a part of this. So I hope you'll enjoy the journey with me over the next three weeks. And I want to start with a story just to, to get you thinking. And, and it starts with uh, this young boy here. Uh, and he, is, uh, he grew up down in a village in Mexico. So this young guy, uh, large family, eight children. He was number six. Uh, he had parents that loved Jesus. In fact, his dad was a, uh, a practicing pastor who was, who was leading indigenous groups of people. He would go into places where people had not heard of Jesus, uh, tribal people who would come out of jungles, and he would witness to them. But as you can imagine, uh, being a parent, uh, mom was working hard raising children, dad was working hard. And, and although they lived out the gospel, this young boy he kind of said he really didn't get the attention that he probably deserved or desperately needed with a large family and a very busy ministry. And uh, he told me the story of this time, though, when all of a sudden some people came to their area where they were doing ministry, and they were living in a very humble house, dirt floors, and uh, this RV pulls up. And of course, this young boy sees this house on wheels, which is magnificent. And several other people came along and they, uh, throughout the course of the week, they served alongside them. And, and there's a time when, when, when this guy, he remembers that he got invited into the RV and all the lights, he was just amazed. In fact, uh, several times he said, it was as if these people had been sent as angels from heaven. And he got to watch a movie, The Sword and the Stone. And they served him hot chocolate and then Rice Krispie Treats. And it just warmed his heart, warmed his mouth, warmed his stomach, but also what he felt was that they treated him like family by inviting him into this. And, and he says, I didn't want to leave the RV. It was a, a great experience. But that group finally, you know, they went on their way and headed back to wherever they're from. And uh, more groups continued to come, and he continued to feel uh, very welcomed. 
Uh, in fact, it says, he said that there was a time when here this other person taught him how to draw and then gave him his first notebook with a pencil. But it came with a message and it said, God loves you and God thinks you are special. And he remembers that at the age of six or seven years old, roughly. And he held on to that and he used it to draw. And, and over the years, more and more people came and he built relationships with, with, with many American teenagers as he was growing up. And one time a guy gave him a Bible verse book, again, very young. And, and the first thing that he remembers memorizing out of God's word was uh, from 1 John 4, where it says, God is love. And through that process, God was interacting with this young boy through people who dedicated time to live on mission. And, and today, that journey continues on, that legacy. And this is uh, Buki and his wife, Teresa, and this is their daughter, Elena. And these are missionaries that we actually work with down in the Baja. And Buki and his wife, they continue to live out that calling, that mission, where teams come, where they work together as gospel partners. And the blessing of these teams is it gives them a platform in their community. And so I want to use this as an example to not only stir your mind to think uh, it's, this isn't about whether or not you're going to be called to Africa, as some people are panicking right now. Oh, no, this is one of those series where I'm going to have to leave the country. Um, although you may be called to that, and I hope you're open to that, the goal is to see that how we can be goers and senders and prayers and how we can be connect, connected and committed to reaching the nations. And so my question starting you off is, I hope that I can answer well, is so why do we make disciples and why should we have a global perspective? And I think that over the last four weeks, we've already kind of unpacked a lot of the why should we make disciples, but I want to press into that today just a little bit more. And I'm going to be all over the Bible today. So this is another one of those messages where we're going to grab a lot. And I want you to know something. In my journey I realized that when I first came to faith in Christ, the Bible to me seemed like uh, I could barely pick it up. It was, it was this deep and this wide, and the amount of information was far more than I could ever even understand. And over 24-some years of reading, studying, getting to walk with God, learning about who He is, it's interesting to me that the cover to cover is shrinking. I, I'm seeing that the thread of God is so clearly woven through this book and I want to understand, we're going to do a 3,000-foot flyover today of some key concepts that will help answer the question, why do we make disciples and why should we have a global perspective? And so um, one key place we'll be in later in the message today is at John 17, but that's not where we're starting. So just think it's an important piece of the, the puzzle, and we'll kind of weave that together. But our story really starts today, our understanding starts with a big, clear picture of something. One is that God has always existed and it is God who created everything. And so we have to hold that. That's Genesis 1.1. God created everything. In fact, when he created the earth, when he created you and me and, and the plants and the animals and everything that's here, he had a plan and a purpose. And his plan was perfect, and his purpose will be fulfilled. And we have to keep that in mind. And so I want to start off with a promise, the promise that God makes, and then the fullness of that promise being fulfilled. So I'm going to take you to two places, and we're going to start in Genesis chapter 3. So if you want to jump there really quick, I want to lay the, the framework for why we're starting there. You see, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and I'm only three chapters in. That's just, just a page and a half in my Bible. In fact, what happens is, is God creates everything, creates man and woman, puts Adam and Eve in the garden, and it is perfect. Everything is the way it was designed to be. It says they walked with God in the cool of the garden, in the cool of the day. And there's this incredible relationship. And, and God says, this is what I desire. Deep, intimate relationship with you, with nothing in the way. But there's one thing in the garden that you can't do. And I just, I had to put it there because I want you to realize you have a choice. And of course, if you uh, read through Genesis, you will find that what happens is they're not to eat a fruit and they choose to eat the fruit and sin enters into the world. And here's this, this horrible moment where the severing of relationship happens because sin enters in. And we're going to look at 
uh, Genesis 3.15. And what happens is, is we're in a dialogue now. We're watching God as he dialogues. And he's actually speaking to the serpent right now. And he's, he's explaining. And, and the serpent basically allowed Satan to enter in and be used by him. So he's speaking to the serpent or Satan. And he's saying this. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And there's this incredible moment as he's talking here. He's, he's about to lay out, hey, serpent, here's this. Here's a problem. Uh, hey, woman, here's this. And, and man, here's this problem. And now he wants to address clearly the promise, though. And, and often we skip over this quickly, but there's kind of a, a word we don't use often in this is enmity. And it's basically the concept that this is a deep-rooted hatred. And he, so he says to the serpent, hey, between you and the woman, there's going to be some serious hatred going on. And I, speaking specifically to Eve at this moment uh, about Eve, but I think we can see that playing out even today. Most women and a large number of men have kind of a distaste and a dislike of snakes. And I, I feel like that's kind of an outpouring of that. Of course, there's a, a bigger a spiritual component here. But then God says this. He says, look, there's going to be not only enmity between this woman, but the offspring, those who choose to behave like you and follow your sinful ways, and then her offspring. And that's the reference that's being made here, that through her, through this woman someday, will come the one who will bruise your head. God makes a promise that he will restore and create the pathway for restoration. And as we know, this is the, the first time really the mention of Jesus is being laid out. That God makes a promise. I will send the one who will crush your head. The problem is that as Jesus comes, he will defeat Satan's plan to steal and destroy. But he will redeem his people as well. And it will cost him dearly. He will shed blood. He will lose his life, but he will rise again and prove who he is. So first we lay out the prom first promise. The promise is there will be someone who will come to restore what was broken in the garden, to restore that, the relationship that was severed by sin. But then I want to take you to the last book of the Bible in Revelation, because I want you to see the, the completion of this promise as it lays out in Revelation. So if you want to turn quickly, you can, but I'll read it to you. Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and this is John looking, and he's receiving a vision. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's this moment in the future coming when all peoples, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, the great representation of all of humanity will be on display in worship. And what a great picture this is. It gives me hope to know that God is at work and he's not going to stop working. It, it, it gives me hope to know that I can have confidence in the finished work of Christ for now and to the future. And it gives me great hope to know that the purpose of God wasn't stopped. It was never put on hold and that I'm a part of his purpose. And I love this picture and I know there's so much we could unpack just in this one passage. But I want you to understand that from Genesis, the front of the book, to his final words in Revelation, God has laid out clearly a plan. And I say it this way, that God continues to have an active outreach in humanity. That it didn't stop in the garden. It didn't stop when uh, Adam and Eve had that moment of time when they sinned. And it continues today where God says, I sent my son and there will be a completion to all things. And that day is coming. 
And so second thing I want you to realize is there was a promise, but there was a fulfillment. And I've spoken about it, but let's press in a little more. This, this fulfillment. Throughout history, God has, has brought people in to continue to forward the movement that God has called for. So we have Moses and Abraham, these great representations of God calling somebody and them going and and fulfilling what God calls them to. And of course, the nation of Israel was this picture that God wanted on display of his glory. And then there's kings and judges and there's sacrifices that were required, all of that pointing to Jesus. So let's go to John 3.16, where we see the fulfillment of these things, the fulfillment of that promise I spoke of when he would crush the head of the serpent. John 3.16 through 17 says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But it goes further. We often skip 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, our God is a missional God. And this is a God who wasn't content to say, oh, wow, I created Adam. I created Eve. It didn't take long. They sinned. That's it. I'm done with you. He says, no, I desire relationship with you and I have a plan and that plan will be fulfilled in Christ. You see, one of the things we have to understand is the cost that that Jesus came and he lived the perfect life, which is amazing to me to think, what was that like to be around somebody who never sinned, never sinned? never did anything out of anger that led to sin, was never tempted in a way that led to sin. But see, he lived that life. And as you know the story, if you don't, I need you to hear this, that he also died on a cross to fulfill all of the, everything that was required to pay the price for that sin of you and me and all the way back to Adam and Eve to pay for that sin. But the best part of the story is that he rose again. And in rising again, he defeats death. He fulfills the promise of a pathway of restoration of relationship with the one true living God. What an awesome story we're a part of. You see, with that resurrection, it did three things for us we can't forget. One, it gave us uh, the, the defeating ability with the Spirit of God to no longer be under the power of sin. No longer will that serpent have control over what I do or don't do. Two, it gave us the ability to be freed from the penalty of sin, that no longer are we going to be separated from God forever. No longer will we experience the torment of knowing that we could not be in relationship with our Father. And then, of course, the great news that someday we'll no longer be in the presence of sin. Sin will no longer be a part of that final conclusion. I'm so grateful for that time. I I desire that to be today. I'd love to, to be in a place where sin was no longer around. But that's a promise that God is giving us, and he has fulfilled it in Christ. And we can't forget how important this is, because what this leads to then is as we see God's love for us on display in Jesus, it should drive us to ask the question, so now what? What do I do with this information? What do I do with this new life if I've placed my life in Christ? What am I called to do with it? And so I want to bring you to the third and final piece of today, and that is the command. And some of you saw the word command and you already slunk back in your seats. You said, oh, no, that word is so aggressive. It scares me. And some of you are scared when you hear command. You have lots of perhaps history in your life where when people commanded you to do things, they were never good. And of course, some of you resist it. I don't want to do what you tell me to do. I don't like this idea of command, and some refuse and some ignore. But I want you to know that a command is a good thing when it comes from a loving God. In fact, what you start to realize is this idea we're, we're going to talk and we'll continue to study through is that we're called to live in obedience, to submit to Jesus and to follow his commands. And living in obedience, when it's done with the right heart and in the view of a loving God, it's a joy. It's truly a joy. It doesn't mean that, that we don't have to take up our cross. Jesus said, you're going to have to do that. 
He says, you're going to have to deny yourself. This command is going to require that. He says, and you're going to have to follow me. And that's why we say we want to be people helping people find and follow Jesus, that we're also engaged in the following of Christ. So what is the command, though? Many of you are familiar with this passage, but it is there very clearly. Jesus, again, talking to his disciples. And in two ways, he's going to talk to his disciples, and he's going to talk to you and me. First, he says, go, therefore, he's speaking to his disciples, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go, teach them and tell them, baptize them, have them learn how to follow me and engage them in this. This is my command, go. But he says this also, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the, always to the very end of the age. Teach them to observe, observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, disciples, go do this. And as you teach them, have them teach them. And so today, you and I have the privilege of having this command lived out. If you're today a follower of Jesus, somebody obeyed this command on your behalf. You ever think of that? Somebody obeyed, and they went, and they shared with you, and today you have received that, and so we should count that as a great blessing. But I want to look now at John 17 to clarify something that is so beautiful. It really, this whole time, I want you to hear the heart of God. Don't miss out on the heart of God, because it's the heart of God. It's the example of God that should drive us to want to fulfill with him this command. And so John 17, you can turn there, but it says this, as you sent me into the world. Oh, by the way, this is an incredible passage to go through. Just go back and read John 17, all of it on your own. This is, Jesus is praying over and to God and over these disciples and you and me in the future. There's so much he lays out, but this is just a piece of it. And so as he's praying, as he's speaking to his disciples, he says this, speaking to the Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Just like you sent me, Father, I'm sending them out. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. They would hold fast to this and be bathed in your truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So for you today, he's praying this over you years ago, so many years back. But then he says in verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, and don't miss this, here's the purpose, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. What an incredible passage. The father says, I'm not content to let sin be where it is. I will defeat it. And so he sends his son, Jesus, and he comes and he fulfills everything. He completes what the promise was that the, the savior would come. And then he says, and now go and share with others. And as you share, teach them to share so that the world may believe that you've sent me. It's an amazing story, and you and I get to be a part of that. And what joy we should find when we find out that God says, go and do this. But back in the, the Matthew uh, 20, 28, it said, and surely I'm with you. Don't forget, I'm with you. This isn't a solo venture. I'm here to join you and be a part of this. And so I want you to look at this really quick, this just real fast, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. It says this. This is from uh, Christopher Wright, and he, he said it this way. It's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. And that's the call on you and me. And so here's uh, three concluding thoughts. One, as you go, go with God. He's begging to join you in his journey. Two, be a blessing. Live out fully in obedience. As you do, you find joy and let that joy flow out of you. Let that peace come out of you. Be a blessing to those. Be a person of peace when you enter the room. And most importantly, 
live sent, that each day is a mission. And each day we're called to that. I have a video I want to just set up for you and watch you listen to. This is uh, some dear friends of mine. They're just going to share a little bit about how God has interacted with them and then how they've joined God as they've been called to serve. So let's watch this. Hi, I'm Bob Young. I'm Kathy. And we're uh, we're members of the mission leadership team. Uh, Early in our Christian walk, we, uh, we had occasional engagement with the Great Commission. A missionary might come and we might give them $25 and and listen to their message with interest. Well, that all changed in the late 80s when close friends of ours were called to the field in Katali, Kenya, and we became involved with that ministry much more deeply. Definitely put on a learning curve. And we were we actually uh, became senders. Uh, we regularly uh, supported them. We were regularly engaged in the Great Commission. Uh, we became prayers. We prayed for them regularly. And uh, finally, in 1993, we were called to go. After that, we became involved with youth ministry for a number of years. And during those years, we were mentored in leading cross-culture teams and began uh, leading teams of youth to Mexico. And typically those were uh, involved with building something, building a house for poor people or working on a church. Uh, When we came to Family Church, uh, our short-term mission experience uh, uh, reached a new level of excellence. Uh, Those teams were to Cambodia were very relational and uh, with both the missionaries and the nationals. And uh, it was a it was a great uh, engagement in the Great Commission. In 2012, we were part of a small team uh, with a large sending team. The church was very involved in sending a small group of us to join the Congdens in South Sudan on an outreach ministry to 100,000 refugees that were streaming into their to the new country. And um, we were helping support the Ethiopian evangelistic team. Yeah, so we, we our short-term mission uh, was a partnership. You know, we engaged in the Great uh, Commission through partnership. Uh, Another aspect of our walk has been perspectives, uh, perspectives on the world Christian movement. And uh, that course has, uh, has really elevated our engagement in the Great Commission uh, in every way. I moved from, I really, perspectives moved me from, from acting and or worrying about my comfort to being focused on God's glory. We also were able to go several times to the yearly Mission Connections event conference in Portland. And that has proved to be very helpful in our understanding of global missions and in our engagement with it. And we heard about a small group in Corvallis that was connected in China. And we served uh, two springs, 2017 and 2018 through that. And since uh, 2015, our mission leadership team has uh, has mostly all taken perspectives, and uh, perspectives has given our team a strategic alignment uh, in uh, engagement with the Great Commission. And our goal is to uh, have every member of Family Church uh, engaged in God's Great Commission. So fun to uh, to work with them, and I had to get them to shorten down their nine minute story to four minutes. But I want you to hopefully hear something. Bob and Kathy, while they do engage in global missions, when they're not out of the country, they're here engaged in global missions and local mission. They they witness to people, they disciple, they met with kids, and continue to work with a variety of people throughout our community but they have a passion to pray for and to care for the nations. And when called, they go. 
And so I wanted to close this part of the message, the first, first of three messages, with some pictures. I just want you to look at the faces for a moment. As I talk, just look at their faces. I Imagine what it would be like if you traveled somewhere and met this person. Or maybe they moved into your neighborhood. Someone with a different culture, a different religious background, a different belief, different language, and you built relationship wherever they lived and came to help them find Christ. And what about these people? What if you worked alongside, gospel partnered with somebody who was teaching them new songs to sing that bring glory to God? And what about this man? What if you were praying for him and found out that he gave his life to Christ and you were a part of that journey? What about this mother and child that you partnered with or maybe served or gave money toward helping them not only receive health care, but to receive the gospel message? What about partnering with a local church that's in a different region with different people and yet you join them on their call to evangelize those in their neighborhoods? What if you went and got hands-on and, like Buki, gave some little boy or girl a color book with some verses, and that was part of their story of how they experienced God's love? So my goal is for you to realize that the DNA of Family Church extends beyond just what we do locally. And you get to be a part of that. I want to close with one last story. See, I was back in, in Africa, and I can't use names or locations, but I want you to hear what it's like to when you get to partner with the nations to fulfill the Great Commission. I woke up last week, and in my morning devotion time, received a message. I'm just going to read that to you, and just listen to the words as we're partnering around the world. And this is what it said. It said, we have a brand new sister. A woman who had been seeking for years was brought to the Lord by our fellow brother and sister. I can't use their names. A few weeks later, we heard of a new brother. Our partners have been praying and sharing with this man for years and years. Recently, he had a surgery, and these two, the brother and sister, went. These followers of Christ went and prayed over this person, and during the night, he was awakened by a bright light. The next day, he was completely healed, restored, even the incision marks from his surgery completely gone. No remnant left of a surgical procedure. He ended up talking with this follower of Jesus who challenged him to give his life to Christ. And he did. But because of the region he lives in, because of, of the other beliefs around him that are hostile to the gospel, he was scared. What, what do I do now? How do I tell my family? And this brother in Christ said, you don't have to worry. You see, your aunt, that woman I opened with, she came to the Lord as well. And so you are together. Wouldn't it be great if your days opened up with that kind of a story? Knowing that you are connecting with and committing to seeing the nations reached. And I want to help you do that, but I'm going to release to the campuses. And I look forward to sharing with you in the next couple of weeks ahead. May the Lord bless you. Now, I know that uh, for some of you who are watching from home, maybe you haven't been in a campus for a while, or maybe this, you're just out of the area. I don't know why you're watching today, but I hope that as you hear this, it excites and ignites in you a passion to see, gosh, God, I can participate, <laughs> not just with my neighbor locally, but I can be a part of what you're doing to see that incredible day when in Revelations it talks, when all the tribes and the tongues and all the nationalities, the differences of the world will come together and glory in your name. And so I want to give you two challenges today. One is I would encourage you to find time to commit to prayer for the nations. Now, you may already have somebody you know that's connected in the mission world, and you want to join praying for them specifically. But just a reminder, we have, we have brochures and pamphlets at our campuses uh, of our missionaries that help you connect in to get to know them more. And several of them have emails and other ways that you can connect through Facebook. But what would it look like if that became part of your daily prayer time, is praying specifically for a missionary? praying for a people group 
or maybe praying for uh, something that's happening like Bible translation or different needs that are, are out there. And we can help you get connected in those. If you want further, you can certainly reach out and email me at craig.hall at fcmail.org. Uh, you can get some more information from me. I'd love to, to get you connected. And then secondly, we're going to go through these throughout the next couple of weeks, but I want to emphasize um, in your prayer time that you commit to some learning. Uh, there are perspectives classes. Of course, we talked about Mission Connection, which has already come and gone, but there'll be another one next year. But there's, there's conferences around all the time to help grow you in learning more about how to, how to be connected to the nations. But other ways you can do that is to search the internet and go look for mission organizations uh, like OMF or Wycliffe. They will teach you all kinds of things about different regions. One more you could look at is Joshua Project. You could look them up as they have access to tons of information. They also kind of keep track of what's going on throughout the globe. So I encourage you to begin to invest in the nations and worry less about where God is, may call you and more about what he's already called you to, which is to go make disciples, be people helping people find and follow Jesus, and be somebody that's invested in seeing that happen as well to the unreached peoples of the world. I love you guys. Let's pray for a moment and I uh, hope you have a blessed day. Thank you, God, so much for your word, for your truth, for your passion to love us, that you would send your son on our behalf. And then, as a model and example, in the fulfillment of bringing Jesus, he sends us out. So may we live on mission for you. And God, we pray that the nations would be reached, that all peoples would hear of your goodness and your mercy and your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.